Okay, we still have a few people coming in. All right. Good evening and welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society's live event with Sarah Manning Peskin, author of A Molecule Away from Madness, Tales of the Hijacked Brain. Before we get started, there are a few things I wanna share with you. First, if you enjoy this program and are interested in seeing what other events we have coming up, please visit our web website at hudsonlibrary.org. Next Monday at 7 p.m., Charlie Denk of Stir Studio Kitchen will be giving a Greek cooking demo to conclude our tour of Greece month. Also, next Wednesday at 7 p.m., we will be hosting historian and journalist Catherine Osler, author of The Duchess Countess, The Woman Who Scandalized 18th Century London. On March 8th at 7 p.m., we will be hosting Margaret Atwood, author of The Handmaid's Tale. Again, please visit hudsonlibrary.org to view our complete calendar and register for our upcoming events. Following the presentation tonight, there will be time devoted to Q&A with the author. We encourage that you get involved by typing your questions into the Q&A section of Zoom at the bottom of the screen at any point during the program. Finally, The Learned Owl, our local independent bookstore, is selling copies of tonight's book, and there is a link in the chat if you'd like to purchase one. And with that, let's get started. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Sarah Manning Peskin. She is an assistant professor of clinical neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Boston Globe, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Her first book, A Molecule Away from Madness, debuted earlier this month, and it has received rave reviews. Welcome, and please take it away. Thanks so much, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is very exciting. So I will, um, I'm going to share my screen and I think I won't see anyone. So just yell if you, um, if I'm talking too fast or if, uh, if you can't hear me. Hold on one second. Um, so I think you should be able to see the slides. So there we go. Um, so I'll be talking about my, my book, A Molecule Away from Madness, Tales of the Hijacked Brain. And uh, this is the idea for the book. So our brains are the most complex machines known to humankind. And yet we have an Achilles heel. So the very molecules that make our brains work can also co-opt our personalities and destroy our ability to think. So our temperament, memories, our relationship to reality can all be lost to these molecules that are billions of times smaller than our brains. And tales of guerrilla warfare have fascinated humans for millennia, but few of us realize that our brains are engaged every day in the same genre of conflict and that we're surviving on the brink. We're battling molecules that can destroy our minds. Sorry. So when I had the idea for the book, um, I wrote down a, a list of diseases that I, uh, that I see often in, uh, in my neurology clinic and in, um, in the neurology boards. And I focused on diseases that change personalities because that's what I'm most interested in. And when I looked at the list in the end, what I realized is that uh, all of them fit into one of sort of four categories. Uh, they're caused by these four different general types of molecules. So the first is mutants, and these are diseases that are caused by changes in DNA. Uh, the second category is rebels, and those are conditions that are caused by changes in proteins. Um, and actually the, the picture above rebels um, is that's actually the, the molecular structure of the protein that makes egg whites white. Um, and if you think of DNA as sort of the, the, uh, the computer code that gives the instructions for being human, proteins are really the, the workhorses of staying alive. That's actually really what does most of the work in our cells is proteins. The next category is uh, diseases that are caused by invaders. Uh, these are conditions that are caused by molecules that uh, breach the body, uh, get into the brain and, and cause havoc. Um, and then the last is evaders. And these are conditions where they're caused by the, the lack of an important molecule. And the, a great example of that is it's a vitamin deficiency. So that's most of the science that you'll need to know for the whole thing. Yeah, so hopefully now you can just sort of uh, sit back and relax and I'll tell you some of the, the stories from the book. 
Um, so the first is a story from the, the first section, which is about mutants. So this is the story of um, August Dieter and, and Dr. Alexis Alzheimer, who you may recognize his, uh, his name, but this is the story of how we, we learned about the disease. So August Dieter was a, a woman, she was in her 40s uh, in the late 1800s. She lived in Germany. And uh, she started having these strange behaviors where she would forget ingredients from cooking. Uh, she would sort of wander around the neighborhood and uh, she would wander into neighboring properties and have to have someone who would have to collect her and bring her back. And she started getting kind of paranoid um, and, and agitated. And her husband brought her to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, go home, pack her things and, and drop her off at the insane asylum. And that's what he did. Um, and she was 51 years old at the time. She never, never gets out alive. Um, but on her first day there, she meets this doctor, Dr. Alex Alzheimer. And Alzheimer uh, was a, a, a German doctor who uh, had a, a great reputation for being brilliant uh, with a microscope and also uh, sort of very social and boisterous. He'd gotten a, a citation for disturbing the peace while he was training. Um, and, uh, and he was just really interested in his patients. And so he meets August Dieter. And he starts trying to examine, you know, what can she do? What can't she do? So he brings a few objects with him and he shows them to her and he says, you know, what's this and what's that? And she seems to be able to name them correctly. But if he goes away and comes back a few minutes later, she has no idea that he was ever there. Uh, and uh, he realizes that she has this really profound disturbance of her memory. And that was something that they, people had seen often in, in people who were older, but it wasn't common to see in someone who was only 51. So it sort of perplexed him. And he spent a long time going back and doing different tests on her and figuring out, you know, how did she do to, with calculations? It turns out she was, was pretty good at making calculations. Um, and uh, eventually she started having a little bit of difficulty with her language where she would call, um, yeah, instead of a cup, she would call it a milk pourer, so things like that. And he sort of tracks her over a year or two. And then he ends up uh, prescribing things like uh, hot water baths um, and sedatives. Nothing really seems to help. She gets more and more agitated. She starts thinking that she um, is hosting a dinner party. And so people would come into the, the asylum and she would be uh, sort of embarrassed that she hasn't set the table. And she's sort of perpetually feeling like she's unprepared for, for hosting. And Alzheimer eventually actually uh, leaves the, the area. His wife dies uh, quite young, and then he ends up moving to Munich, but he never really forgets about August Dieter. And in Munich, he sets up this lab at the University of Munich, uh, but he keeps in touch with the folks at this initial uh, asylum. And at one point, he even actually pays out of his own money to keep August Dieter in this asylum where she was because he wants to be able to examine her brain after she passes away. Um, and you can imagine nowadays, if you have a question about your brain, you can go to the doctor and they can order an MRI or a CAT scan. Um, in those times, if you wanted to know what the brain looked like, you had to wait till someone passed away. So that's what Alzheimer did. And sure enough, a few years later, he gets a call from a, an intern from the, uh, this initial asylum uh, who says, you know, I know you were interested in this patient. You want me to send over her brain. And Alzheimer says, sure, send, send it over. So he unpacks it uh, and they've also sent over her records uh, but, and uh, he, he unpacks the brain and he starts uh, slicing it into small pieces and he looks at it under a microscope. And this isn't the exact you know, photos of what he saw, but this is essentially uh, the structures that he noticed. Um, so he noticed that there were these things called plaques. That's the, um, on the bottom left, they're sort of these, uh, they look sort of like a spray painted spot. Um, and those are outside of neurons. That's in sort of like the, um, the supportive structure in the brain. And then he noticed these things called tangles and they look sort of, and this isn't the, maybe perhaps the best picture, but they look sort of like spaghetti um, inside of neurons. And he's really surprised at these structures. He's never seen anything quite like it. Yeah. And at that point, it, it was thought that people who lost their memories, that the problem was what they called hardening of the arteries. But he saw so many of these plaques and tangles that he thought, you know, I wonder if this is actually what's causing the disease. So he ends up going, uh, putting his slides together um, and going to another city in Germany to this conference. And he goes up to the podium and he delivers this talk about this unusual finding with August Dieter. And he finalizes his, one of the final statements he says is, you know, is this 
an old disease or have I actually discovered something new? And it turns out there's total silence in the audience. Uh, no one really seems to be particularly interested, uh, but he sort of goes back to his seat. Someone later writes that they thought his, his presentation was inappropriate for the context. And, uh, and later in the day, someone gives a presentation about excessive masturbation and the audience loves it. They're totally enamored with the speaker. Yeah, they, uh, they are completely engaged. And August and, uh, Alzheimer ends up going back to his lab, sort of uh, disappointed and yeah, surprised that he didn't get more attention for his finding. So he, uh, he keeps working away at the finding. And eventually, only a few years later, one of his teachers publishes a, a new version of a textbook where he talks about August Dieter's case. And he calls this disease Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that's how this term, Alzheimer's disease, uh, gets established. So Alzheimer ends up getting a, a fair amount of sort of fame and attention for his discovery, but it dies quite young, ends up dying at age 51, which was the same age that August Dieter was when, uh, when she first came to the asylum. And so this, that's one of the stories that I tell in the, in the book. Yeah, it's in the section about DNA for a sort of unusual reason. So most cases of Alzheimer's disease are not genetic. Um, they're related to some sort of, maybe a, a sort of a, a plethora of genes that might give you a little bit of an increased risk and maybe some input from the environment and, and we're not really sure. But there are some rare cases of Alzheimer's disease that are caused by a change in a single gene. And those types of cases, yeah, they tend to travel in families and they tend to cause disease in people when they're in their 30s and 40s and 50s. And there is a particular group of people um, in Colombia who actually have those mutations. And there is a researcher over here. There's a researcher named, named um, Francisco Lopera who's studying this, this group in Colombia. And he sort of discovered them in the 80s uh, and, and worked uh, collecting information on them. And this has just done this incredible job uh, creating a research program in Colombia. Uh, and he created it even at a time when, when there was an immense amount of violence, uh, he persisted. And uh, he uh, created this cohort uh, and engaged them in research. Um, and these are people who have a genetic mutation where we actually can tell looking at their genes if they're gonna have early onset Alzheimer's disease or not. Um, and Lopera's thought is actually, if we study these people who are even though they're not the typical case of Alzheimer's disease, that's, where, that's how we're gonna cure Alzheimer's disease. It's by studying these unusual cases where it's caused by a single gene mutation. And, and that the cure is not sort of in the, the molecular mainstream, but actually on the sort of the, the molecular edge. So the next story is from the, the, the second chapter. Um, and so this is, uh, or the second section, this is a section about rebels. So these are proteins uh, that have gone haywire. And keep in mind, so DNA is the instructions for being a human, essentially. Uh, proteins are really the workhorses. Those are the ones that are really keep us alive. Um, but sometimes they can turn on us. And uh, this is one such story. So this is the story of, of a disease called Kuru. So uh, there was uh, a, uh, a doctor named uh, Vincent Zegas, and he was born in Estonia, moved to Australia, and was sort of looking to uh, get out into the, into the bush. He wanted to get away from consumerism and wanted to live in, in sort of majestic nature. So he takes this gig uh, being a public health officer in Papua New Guinea. And he talks about flying there in this uh, small plane where uh, it's sort of uh, jump, uh, flying up and down with small gusts. And uh, he's the only guy on the plane, except for the pilot who's going to leave as soon as he drops him off. Um, other than that, there's a few sheep and some kerosene, and, and that's about it. And so he settles in this uh, rural Papua New Guinea uh, area. And he pretty quickly learns that even though he was told he was just going to have to practice medicine, you know, he actually has to be the local surgeon. So he learns how to use uh, maggots to clean wounds. Uh, he learns how to uh, fix broken bones. Uh, he learns how to help people with injuries from uh, wild pigs who were, they were sort of um, venerated, uh, but often would injure people. Uh, and he lives in Papua New Guinea for a few years until he meets this uh, Australian uh, who uh, had been Hi, had been sent to Oster, sent to uh, Papua New Guinea to build roads, but essentially uh, became sort of a, a, a very heavy drinker, didn't do quite, uh, quite as much work as he was uh, said to do. Um, but May had made this unusual observation that he told Zegas about. And this Australian guy tells Zegas about this disease he's been seeing in 
rural Papua New Guinea. And he says, there's all these women and children and they're starting to shake and no one can figure out why. And they also start to lose their words. So uh, they stop making sense and they have this really strange sort of vacant laughter uh, where they're sort of laughing even though the situation isn't, you know, isn't, is not humorous. And, uh, and then they die within a few months or within the year of, of developing the disease. And the disease was so bad that actually uh, they were running out of, of women to marry. So in, in most, most tribes in Papua New Guinea, there were um, you know, many women and, and men tended to be killed in warfare. In this tribe, actually, uh, there were many men and they wouldn't have enough women because so many of them were dying from this disease um, and, and, and children as well. And it seemed to be that the disease was infectious because people could tell it didn't exist until about the sort of early 1900s or so. And by this time in the mid 1900s, it seemed to be you know, very, very common, but nobody really knew what transmitted it, you know, what caused it. And so uh, Zegas is very interested, obviously, and uh, this Australian uh, drunk says, uh, you know, I'll take you there. So uh, a few months later, Zegas is sitting on his porch and a few people uh, come up to him uh, that he doesn't know. They hand him this note that's wrapped in, uh, in leaves and tied with jungle vine. He opens it up and it says, you know, go with Apakono. And Apakono is the guy who's standing in front of him. And so they venture out into this, the highlands of Papua New Guinea and Ziga starts seeing this disease and it looks exactly like this guy described where uh, when he sees women with the disease, they sort of try to stand up to a standing position. They'll sort of gaze at him, start laughing and then often fall down. And the same with, with children. And he sees it in people you know, who are you know, 10 years old, really young kids. Um, and he's just sort of horrified by what's happening. He goes back to his cottage and starts writing letters around the world saying, you know, this is what I'm seeing. Does anyone recognize it? Uh, it doesn't get much of an answer initially. And then another scientist ends up joining him uh, and they end up setting up shop in the middle of this, uh, this epidemic. And uh, they, they convince the people to actually donate bodies and to, to allow them to study the people's brains. And they start creating slides from the, the brains of people with Kuru and they send them out all around the world and say, you know, please help tell us, you know, what is this? And one of the places they send it to um, is the National Institute of Health or the NIH um, in the US. And then they also send it to the, um, this uh, museum. They set up a, an exhibit in London. And um, it, the, uh, at the NIH, uh, the scientist takes a look at the slides and says, you know, this looks a lot like the disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is a different disease in humans uh, that's very rare, but actually causes really similar symptoms. It tends to cause people to have difficulty with balance, difficulty reaching for an object. Uh, it, it causes them to have a very rapid onset uh, dementia with, with, uh, with confusion, and, uh, and often they die within, within the year. And the slides that get sent to this museum in London uh, get put up for an exhibit. And this veterinarian stops by and he says, you know, these, these slides look, uh, look exactly like the, the microscopic images of sheep that I've been studying that have this disease called scrapie. And scrapie actually causes similar symptoms in sheep. Yeah, and it causes them to get sort of unsteady on their feet. The name actually comes from the fact that it causes sheep to um, scrape their skin against things. Um, and so they start to realize that these diseases, Kuru, this disease in Papua New Guinea, uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is this disease in humans that they mentioned at the NIH, um, and Scrapie, this disease in sheep, they actually all look really similar under a microscope. And this is sort of what they, what we now know they look like. Uh, but they're called what's called spongiform encep encephalopathies. That's the name we have for them now. And you can sort of see in the top left is a normal brain. And you can see in the, the right and the, or the other three slides, you can see they look sort of spongy. There's almost like pieces are, are missing. Um, and that's what these diseases do to the brain. But the question remained, you know, what was causing these? So in all of these cases, so um, it, studying Kuru, yeah, studying Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, studying Scrapie, all of them seemed to be infectious, but nobody could figure out what was causing the infection. And when they look for typical things like um, a bacteria or a fungus or a virus, nobody could find anything. And so it, it sort of goes on like that for a long time until this scientist, Stanley Prusner, uh, starts taking a look. And he's a scientist in San Francisco, and he tends to be sort of a, a counterculture type of guy. 
and he takes samples of people who've had you know Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease or um, or sheep who had scrapie, and he starts filtering the samples through sort of smaller and smaller receipts. And yeah, he sort of essentially filters it into smaller and smaller pieces. And he finds out that actually the cause of the disease isn't something as big as a bacteria or a virus. It's actually something so small it's caused by a protein. And even more curious is that the disease is caused by a protein that all of us have. So, you know, if someone gets a, a, a infection, the idea that we usually think about is that uh, you know, they've gotten an infection because a bacteria is in their body or is invading their body or spreading in their body, whereas it's not spreading in someone who's, who's healthy. In this case, the protein that causes the infection is universal. We all have it. And uh, it, what he, what Prusner discovered is actually that it's caused by, an, it's caused by proteins that change shape. So proteins are these incredibly complex uh, 3D structures that really only work because uh, they have particular forms. And when this protein, which Prusner called it prion proteins, which is a combination of protein and infection, so prion. Um, so he, uh, it turns out in prion proteins, normally they're in these sort of stiff helices. They, they look sort of like slinkies that have been frozen in place. And in these types of diseases, uh, the structure unfolds. And what's particularly dangerous is actually when you have these unfolded structures, which is the one on the bottom with this blue, they actually become essentially contagious where the pro the, an unfolded protein in that structure can actually cause the other proteins around it to adopt that same dangerous structure. So that's how these proteins were infectious. It's that if you have one bad one, it essentially, it essentially convinces all the other proteins around it to adopt the toxic structure. So going back to Kuru, what, what was the actual cause of Kuru? With the help of some um, anthropologists and their, uh, their sociologists, uh, they actually connected Kuru to the practice of cannibalism. So the Four tribe, which was the tribe that, that suffered from Kuru, they had a practice of endocannibalism, which means they would eat their own members. Um, so after someone would die, they had these funerary practices uh, where they would uh, slice up the brain and usually the women were the one who ate, uh, who ate the brain and they would bring home leftovers to children. And that's why this affected women and children. And it had actually been passed along uh, in the brains of people who had, had died from it. And it hadn't affected other, other tribes because they didn't do endocannibalism. They didn't tend to eat their own members. And once they figured it out, they outlawed cannibalism and Kuru you know, hasn't existed for, for years now once they, once they did that. Um, so the next story I'll tell is from the section, um, this is from invaders, or this is an example of a invader. Yeah. And this goes back to the, uh, the 1950s. So it used to be that um, when, some, when people needed surgery, unless you could use sort of a local anesthetic like lidocaine, um, you had to use general anesthesia, which means you give someone a medication that fall, makes them fall asleep, but it also has the side effect that it stops people from breathing. And for healthy people, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. You would sort of thread a breathing tube down their throat, someone would do the operation, and then they would take the breathing tube out, and, and that was it. But for a lot of people who were sick, that process of putting the tube down the throat, using a machine to breathe for someone, and then having to take it out, yeah, it didn't go so smoothly. And so there were people who would need surgery, and they couldn't have surgery because they couldn't tolerate the anesthesia. And it was a big problem in medicine. And there was a pharmaceutical company in, uh, in Detroit who um, they figured out this, uh, or they sort of, uh, they modified a bunch of substances that they knew about. And they found that if they modified a certain substance, they could get this, uh, this uh, molecule that would uh, cause people to fall asleep. Um, or cause, it was first done in animals. It would cause the animals to fall asleep. And they could do surgeries on the animals. They could take out a gallbladder. They could move a piece of skin. And uh, all the while, the animals would be sort of uh, resting comfortably, but they wouldn't, they would be breathing on their own. So they could have surgeries without needing a breathing tube. And it was thought to be this miraculous discovery. People were saying, you know, I've never seen something quite like this. And um, the company names it CERNAL, which is supposed to evoke the sort of, they call it the, the pillowy serenity of, of, uh, of this medication, uh, that you're going to feel so relaxed and comfortable and asleep while you have your surgery, and then you'll wake up and, and go about your regular activities. Um, and so they get approval from the FDA, and they send out this you know, white powder, this substance throughout the country. 
And pretty soon they start getting stories back yeah, that people who've gotten this medication end up incredibly agitated and aggressive. Um, they are becoming extraordinarily violent. And sometimes the medication seems to stay in patients for two days. Whereas you could imagine normally you wanna be able to wake someone up after surgery very quickly. And the medication, which you know, we, we, uh, is, has a more familiar name of, of PCP, uh, but is now you know, is quickly taken off the market. So it was only on the market for a short time. It uh, became uh, a, a drug of abuse for uh, a few years. Um, and then people moved on to, to more fun and less scary drugs of abuse. And, um, and now we, we actually don't even include PCP on the, the drug panel for a lot of hospitals because it's, its use is so infrequent. And we know now that the way that the drug works is it causes people to dissociate. So you can imagine you have your, your limbic system, which processes emotions. And it's really important for that limbic system to be able to take input from the outside world. And what PCP does is it causes you to dissociate. So you're essentially at the mercy of your limbic system. You no longer sort of sense the outside world. So it worked very well as a anesthetic where people essentially sort of couldn't understand yeah, that something painful was happening to them. Um, but in the meantime, they were subject to their own thoughts uh, being uh, sort of created as reality. And, and that's how PCP works. So that's how it causes you to, um, to dissociate. And that's why uh, we, we don't use it as, a, um, as an anesthetic anymore. Um, and then lastly is the story of a evader. So these are things where um, we need them in the body and, um, and they're conspicuously absent. And this is the story of, of Joseph Goldberger and a disease called pellagra. So yeah, in the, yeah, the early 1900s, people started noticing yeah, this condition called pellagra in the southeastern United States. And it was predominantly among, among poor farmers uh, and people who were in, uh, in asylums or in orphanages. And it was this uh, incredibly gruesome conditions that caused people to develop this, uh, this sort of rash, often on areas that are exposed to the sun. And uh, it caused people to develop an upset stomach um, and this dementia. And it becomes, it, it had been sort of unheard of before uh, in the United States, but starting in the early 1900s, it becomes more and more common to the point where it's, it's affecting hundreds of thousands of people per year. Um, in some cases, like 40% of the people who get it are dying from it. It's just, um, it's a horrible epidemic and no one can figure out what's, what's causing it. And there was this idea uh, sort of flying around that um, it was caused by an infection that was transmitted by flies. And no one could really prove it, yeah, but people tended to like that idea because the disease tended to affect poor people. And this way they could say, you know, it was, it was their fault. It was related to their own sanitary practice. So the idea felt sort of um, comfortable for people. And, but it, it becomes you know, harder and harder to, to prove and people are having trouble figuring out whether that's, that's really the case. So the Surgeon General calls on this guy, Joseph Goldberger. And Goldberger was born at the, the foot of the Carpathian Mountains. He came to the U.S. at age nine, speaking almost no English. He starts working for his father uh, in the, a, 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 a small grocery store. And there's this, there's stories that he would hide books under his jacket. So he would go and sort of deliver groceries and then stop and read and then go back and pick up another, uh, another uh, load. Um, but he ends up growing up and he uh, trains as a, as a physician, tries to hang a shingle and, and can't make enough money. He makes about the equivalent of today would be like $400 a month and, and can't live on that. And so he decides to join the, the, the public health service. And he goes off and he goes to, um, to, uh, to Mexico. He goes all over the, the uh, US and he uh, looks at uh, typhus and typhoid and yellow fever. He comes down with the diseases himself. So he's really sort of in the, in the trenches. And then come 1914, the Surgeon General calls on Goldberger and says, you know, could you take a look at pellagra? Can you help us figure out what's causing it? And Goldberger takes a look at the evidence and starts to think that it's not caused by a uh, infection. He actually starts to think that it's caused by a deficiency in the diet. And it's a really controversial idea because um, it's not as palatable to people um, because it, essentially it's implying that we're starving our own people. Um, rather than something that it's a disease that's brought on, you know, uh, brought on people by themselves. It's, it's actually, we're, we're starving people. And so he gets a lot of pushback and um, eventually he actually decides that he is going to prove that it's not infectious by taking matters in his own hands. 
And so yeah, he yeah, goes to a hospital that has a lot of patients with pellagra. And he actually starts taking samples of, of blood and of the scales from the skin and, and of urine and stool and, um, and saliva and essentially exposing himself and other volunteers to all of these. Um, his wife actually volunteered for the experiments and he sort of limited her exposure. Yeah, but, but, uh, but even she was sort of so convinced by him that she wanted to participate. And yeah, he writes the whole experiment up uh, a few months later and says, you know, considering the amount of filth that we were exposed to, uh, it's pretty impressive that all we had was an upset stomach and, um, and none of us got pellagra. And so, you know, he says you know, he's proven once and for all that it's not infectious. And uh, eventually he goes on to realize that, uh, that pellagra is actually caused by a, um, a deficient diet. And he starts to suspect that it's caused by a deficiency in a B vitamin. At that point, they had just discovered that B, there was more than one B vitamin. We sort of now think of, you, know, you go to the, you go to the, uh, the pharmacy and pick up a, a B complex. It used to be people didn't realize that that was a bunch of different molecules together. Um, so this was in the early days of vitamin research. And Goldberger, Goldberger suspects that what's missing is one of these pieces of the, the B vitamin complex. Um, and it turns out he's right, although he eventually um, actually passes away before they can figure out exactly what causes it. Um, and uh, he got nominated for a, a Nobel Prize uh, multiple times, although never actually never actually won it. Um, but eventually they figure out that pellagra is actually caused by a, a deficiency in, in vitamin B3. And uh, people had actually known about vitamin B3 for years. It had been sitting on the shelf uh, in a researcher's lab, but people didn't realize that that was the solution to the epidemic. Um, but what they start doing is actually putting vitamins in flour um, around the time of World War II. And that's why uh, you know, we have fortified uh, uh, foods now. That's what started in World War II. And that's why vitamin deficiencies are so uncommon now. So that even if you don't take vitamin supplements, you're probably getting enough um, in your food. So that's sort of the, the last story. Hopefully I haven't uh, bored you terribly. I can't see any of you. So if you are sleeping, uh, I won't know. Uh, but, and, uh, and I'll sort of uh, take the screen off and, um, and then take a look at questions. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Um, we have, so yeah, please, everyone, please ask your questions. We had one come in. Someone just wanted clarification on what happened to Dr. Alzheimer. How, what did he die of? Yeah, so, so he didn't die of the disease that he discovered. He, um, and I have to go back. It's, it, it's in the book and I'm, I'm, uh, I may be misremembering. I want to say that he died of, of heart failure. Um, but I could be wrong. It's, I, it's, uh, I know it's in the book and hopefully it's, it's written dramatically and nicely in the book, but, uh, but now I'm not remembering. He did have, um, he had his, his kids at his, um, at his bedside when he passed away. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to know a little bit more about your background and how you became interested in the subject. So, yeah, but I, I started off, um, more as a basic scientist. Yeah, but so, uh, but actually after college, I had applied to um, these combined programs where it's um, MD, PhD programs where you do both degrees. Yeah, but, and then uh, I did the beginning of medical school and then I went off to do my PhD and I realized that I loved writing about science, but I didn't actually want to do any of the experiments myself. Yeah, I actually liked talking about science and writing about it more than I liked, you know, sitting, uh, you know, at 10 p.m. on a Friday night waiting for a vat of bacteria to grow. And um, so I ended up actually quitting my PhD and going back to medical school. And then as a resident, uh, we had to do night shift and we had to do two months of, of nights. And sometimes they were really busy, but sometimes they were quiet and, um, and a little bit lonely. And that's when I started writing. Um, and then I did some sort of memoir pieces. I wrote a, a, um, a modern love piece about uh, a, a honeymoon or a honeymoon that we had, uh, had gotten lost on. Um, and then I shifted to writing about, um, writing about neurology and writing about medicine. Yeah, that was great. You have your articles linked on your website, just your range like of stuff that you write about was really cool. Um, at, at one point, my husband told me to stop writing about our marriage, so I had to shift <laughs> to something else. <laughs> Um, so we have a question about what research you're working on now. So right now I do, um, I work on um, clinical research projects. Um, so there are research visits for people who are involved in, in clinical trials. 
Um, most of the diseases that I wrote about in the book actually have cures. Um, but there are these big giants like Alzheimer's disease where um, that's sort of the holy grail that we, we don't have a treatment yet. Um, but the only way we'll find a cure is, is in research trials. Um, so that's, that's the, the work that I do. Okay, hey, yeah, that, that kind of relates to another question that came in that, that's basically, if Alzheimer's started studying this so early on, why isn't there a cure or better treatments for it? Yeah, and it's, so many of us are asking ourselves, you know, how is it that, um, you know, cancer doctors have found wonderful treatments yeah, and they have this whole arsenal of uh, molecularly targeted treatments for their patients. So if you come in with breast cancer, they're gonna take a biopsy and they're gonna tell you exactly what molecules your breast cancer has and they're gonna choose a treatment based on that. We don't, we don't have that yet yeah, in the brain. And there's a few reasons for that. One is yeah, it's extraordinarily hard to figure out what's actually happening under a microscope in someone's brain. So people come in, we do lots of tests on them. You know, we take pictures of their brain, and even in a yeah, in a sort of um, a big center like ours, we're only about sort of eighty or ninety percent ac accurate in deciding if someone has Alzheimer's disease. So about ten percent of the time, we we get tricked despite all of it. We more recently, we actually have the technology to uh, detect the proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease in living people. So we've gotten so much better. That's been a huge, a huge um, sort of leap uh, where we can now uh, essentially be, be sure that someone has Alzheimer's disease while they're still alive. But that's, that's fairly recent. So for a long time, we were enrolling people in trials that didn't actually have Alzheimer's disease. So you can imagine it's really hard to figure out if a drug works if you're testing it on people who don't have the disease that you care about. Um, so that's one of the things, and, and the other, uh, among others, but another big reason is that the disease evolves really slowly in patients. And so it's really hard to, to study a disease that progresses so slowly because it's really hard to see a signal uh, when something changes. And there are, there are other reasons also, yeah, but, um, but those are two of the, of the big ones. Um, so we have a question, it says, with all of your research, have your own health habits changed? And I guess a follow-up that I was curious, um, with all of this, like if people are, are concerned about neurological conditions, like how can we be proactive? Yeah, so the 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 uh, the spiel that we give, and I would say I, I I try to follow this, but no one's ever the perfect, no one's ever the perfect patient, even though we tell people what to do. Yeah, but, but the, the really the four things are yeah, one is exercise. There is a immense amount of extra of data showing that exercise slows cognitive decline, both in people with diseases and also normal people. It's just a it's it's so impressive the effect that it has. And usually we, it's about you know, 30 to 40 minutes, three to four days a week. And it has to be something aerobic. So it turns out people have done head-to-head -head comparisons looking at aerobic activities like uh, you know, Zumba or running or biking compared to yoga or stretching. And yoga or stretching doesn't seem to have the same effect. So that's the biggest one. The Mediterranean diet probably has the best data for cognition. Um, and then the other two pieces are social and intellectual engagement. Um, there are good studies dating back from the 80s that the more points of contact you have uh, with your community around you, yeah, the slower people decline. And then in terms of intellectual engagement, it's really whatever you like. So there's no reason, you know, if you, um, if you like crossword puzzles, do crossword puzzles. If you like reading a book, read a book. Um, if you like Audible, then listen to books on tape, you know, that, that's just fine. Um, the goal is really just finding something you like and, and engaging. Thank you. Is mad cow related to the prion you described? It is. So we actually know now we know more diseases than we used to um, that are yeah, that are uh, these prion diseases. So they're caused by misfolded proteins. Um, so mad cow disease is one of them. There's also a really unusual condition called fatal familial insomnia. And there's a there was a neat book that came out a few years ago about that. Um, and that's also caused by, by prion disease. Um, you mentioned, you, you were talking about the evaders, you were talking about vitamins. Someone has asked, um, are manufactured vitamins as beneficial as those naturally occurring ones? So and I would say, I'm not, I will fully admit that I'm not, you know, a vitamin, a vitamin expert. So I would say that when I, you know, I'm not sure I'm totally qualified to, um, to answer. Yeah, it is true that I will say from a cognitive perspective, 
most people get enough vitamins in their diet and that they don't need extra vitamins. Um, we tend to, you know, the two that we often think about in terms of cognition. So there's, there's niacin, the one that I had mentioned. Um, most people are not deficient in that because um, it's, it's in what we eat. Um, the, the vitamin deficiencies we do see are, one is B12 deficiency. Um, and so uh, to figure out if you need B12, you really, there's a blood test for it. So um, you can sort of see if you're low. And the other one that we see, particularly in patients who have a history of alcohol use, um, their heavy alcohol use is actually a thymine deficiency or B1 deficiency um, that causes this really unusual condition um, called, uh, they can cause people to do what's called confabulations where they essentially uh, sort of this isn't the completely correct explanation, but they sort of fill in gaps um, in their memory. Um, and so they, it's called sort of honest lying, where they create memories of things that never actually happen, but it's not on purpose. They're not aware that they're doing it. So we have a question here. It says, um, first of all, nice presentation. In families with genetic early onset Alzheimer's disease, is it possible to test for the gene? What is your view of the ethical issues in such screening? So um, we do a lot of genetic testing in our center. Um, and um, I will say for most people who have late onset Alzheimer's disease, there isn't one of these genes. Um, but when someone comes in and they have a history of multiple people in their family who've had Alzheimer's disease in their you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, we really worry about these, these uh, mutations. And, um, and we do test for them. And there's a few reasons to think about genetic testing. Uh, one is uh, sometimes for people who were not positive about the diagnosis, if we find the gene, then, we've, then we're sort of convinced. Um, another is uh, for research studies. There are some research studies that are particularly directed at people who have genetic mutations. Often those are, they're studying a drug that has a certain mechanism and the mechanism will only work in people who have this, this mutation, this problem. And the other one, which is this sort of incredible change, um, is that we actually now have the chain, have the, the power to essentially remove mutations from people's lineages. So um, if someone has a mutation and they want to have children, uh, they can use IVF to actually have children, have biological children who don't have the mutation. Um, so what they actually do is uh, you know, you merge the sperm and egg in a, in a petri dish. You can take away one of the cells, look and see if it has the mutation, and then you would only uh, sort of um, implant or you would only use an embryo that, that doesn't have the mutation. Um, and that's just this incredible technology. You can literally remove mutations from, um, from someone's lineage. Is there a difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So that's the most common question that I have that I ever get in clinic. Yeah, and there, there is, and they're not, you can have one without the other. So when we think about cognition, the first question is, you know, how well does someone function in real life? What does it look like when they move about the world? Um, and there's a spectrum. So there's normal, which is normal for your age and education. There's something called mild cognitive impairment. That's where you notice a problem. We can pick up something a little bit abnormal on testing, but you're, you're doing everything you always used to do, it's just a little bit harder. And then there's dementia. And what dementia means is that there are sort of complex activities that you can't do. So um, you can't drive or you can't manage your bills or um, you, know, you can't cook because of the memory and thinking problems. So that's what dementia means. It's actually a description of what does it look like when someone functions in the real world. Alzheimer's disease is a description of what's going on under a microscope. So it's it's defined by buildup of you know, plaques and tangles, which are, we now know are made of these proteins called amyloid and tau, but that's what defines Alzheimer's disease. And we've actually become so good at detecting it that we now have some people who are totally normal. So they don't have any symptoms and they're normal on cognitive testing, but we can use these imaging techniques and figure out that they have amyloid and tau buildup. So they actually have Alzheimer's disease, even though they are completely normal. Um, and then there are also people who have dementia. So they have, you know, in everyday life, they have difficulty, um, but they don't have Alzheimer's disease. So under a microscope, they don't have amyloid and tau. Their symptoms are actually caused by something else. So it might be caused by something like uh, Lewy body disease or frontotemporal dementia or vascular disease. So all these other conditions. Um, so dementia and Alzheimer's disease are linked. Um, so about 70 to about 70% of cases of dementia are caused by Alzheimer's disease. But you know you can have Alzheimer's disease without dementia, and you can have dementia without Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. 
Um, how did you choose the title of your book? Um, it was a little bit of a, it, it evolved over time. So it um, it started off as um, I think a molecule of madness, and then um, a um, a mentor of mine suggested a molecule from madness, and then a reader suggested a molecule away from madness, and that's how it how it uh, sort of evolved. And then there was lots of debate about whether it was too intimidating to use the word molecule in a title. Yeah, but we we eventually decided it was okay. Um, is there a link to diabetes and Alzheimer's? So yeah, we know that there's an increased risk um, in people who have diabetes, but where there's an increased risk of dementia um, in people who have diabetes, but exactly how that works, for, we don't 100% know. Were there any stories in the book that you wanted to tell that you didn't get to? Um, so there, there, uh, there were, was one story that I ended up mixing at the very last minute. Uh, that was a story of a, um, actually a serial killer in um, Victorian uh, London who lived uh, around the time of Jack the Ripper, but actually killed more people than him. Um, and he uh, was actually, a, he was a physician. And he uh, ended up uh, killing several women and they died in this uh, really dramatic uh, manner where they uh, would essentially have these whole body spasms. And uh, they, he actually ended up uh, sort of um, sending these threatening letters to police and investigators. And they ended up figuring out that it was his handwriting and, uh, and that he was the one who had done the murders. And uh, the drug that he used actually works um, similar to a, a disease that I, I write about in the book. Um, but I ended up nixing that story and instead telling the, the history of, of neurotransmitters. So the history of things like um, dopamine and, and serotonin and things like that. Yeah, I think I think my favorite part of the book was like the stories you tell. They're so great. It, it was so cool how this complex subject you make it so accessible. Is that something you really thought about while you were writing? Um, how how did you, how did you go about accomplishing that? Thanks. I, I'm glad it felt accessible because that was a, a, a yeah, that was the goal. Um, and I so I'm I'm in a, a writing group and no one else in the writing group um, is in medicine and that was probably one of the most valuable tools um, is having writers who had never been to med school because um, I think I had no concept of how many of the words that I used were were medical jargon and and made no sense and I actually will say in my own practice with patients um, I talk to them really differently now. Um, cause I'm a lot more, right. I hopefully am yeah, more aware of when I use words that are, are actually sort of inaccessible and not familiar and, and not useful to them. We have someone on here who is interested in becoming a neurologist. Do you have any tips on what kind of research, um, or just any general tips? On becoming a neurologist? Um, yeah. it's a great question. Um, cause I guess I, I sort of, um, decided at the last minute. So I don't know if I have the, uh, have the, the perfect one. Um, but I think the main thing is to, to see patients who have different types of neurologic diseases. There's so much breadth in neurology. Um, so the patients that I see are all sort of, um, if some of them are, are cognitively normal, but many of them are slowly losing their, their identities. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of treating families in some ways. It's very much not a, a broken bone disease. It's, it's treating patients and also treating the people who are watching them go through it. Um, but there are other kinds of neurology that are totally different where, you know, all of the people, you know, other colleagues of mine see patients that are essentially all cognitively normal, um, but have other issues like uh, seizures or they have, you know, progressive weakness uh, or yeah, they have, uh, uh, inflammatory diseases like multiple sclerosis. Um, so there's just, there's a huge amount of variety. Um, so I think the main thing is, is just trying to get exposed and, and to if you find any way just to, um, to get in the clinic and start, um, start seeing people. Um, we have a question here about Lewy body. Um, how is that different than other dimensions? So Lewy body um, is, uh, is, under a microscope, it looks different than Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's, if you look under a microscope, you'll see plaques and tangles, which is those proteins, uh, amyloid and tau. Lewy body, when you look under a microscope, you'll see buildup of a different protein called synuclein. 
Um, and it was uh, it was discovered by this guy, Dr. Louis, uh, who uh, fled um, fled Europe in in uh, World War II, and then actually settled uh, around around here on me um, in the Bifilli area, and and made his discoveries. And Louis body disease tends to cause different symptoms. So the classic finding um, in Louis body disease is what's called well-formed hallucinations. So you have patients who come in and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my bedroom and I see a few people sitting on the bed and I, I know they're not real, but they look really, they look really vivid and they really seem real. And they're often not threatening. So they're not, sometimes they're scary to people, but often they're not scary. They're just, you know, surprising. Um, or people will say, you know, I looked out the window and I, I thought I saw, you know, a bear walking by. People will see animals. Um, and uh, that's sort of a, a classic finding in Lewy body disease. Um, we have a question about short-term memory. Um, does it change as we age? How does it change as we age? So it does. So yeah, um, this is a surprising thing that people um, people often sort of I think don't pay attention to is that even in normal aging, um, cognition changes. So there are sort of you can sort of think of cognition in two different groups. So there are some skills um, that get better and better and better until your 60s or so, and then they get worse. And that's things like um, uh, remembering facts, like why do we have a parole system, something like that. Um, there are other skills that are called fluid intelligence. That's things like um, there's a detour and you have to find your way around without a GPS. Or um, I'm gonna give you a list of 10 grocery store items and I want you to go to the grocery store without a list and, and pick them up. Those types of skills, it turns out, um, start getting worse in our 20s and just get worse and worse and worse over the rest of our lives. Um, so even in normal cognition, there is a decline. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, is someone normal or not normal? The question isn't, you know, are they worse now than they were five years ago? The question is, how do they compare to peers, um, you know, of the same age and the same education? Um, so you really have to sort of standardize it. So cognitive decline, cognition declines even in normal aging. There's actually, there's a, um, there's a, a talk that I've done called, um, am I losing my marbles or am I just getting old? That sort of um, is sort of about that. Um, and there's a, a piece that'll come out in the, in the Washington Post that sort of addresses that topic. Is there a link between Parkinson's and some of these conditions? So yeah, so it's so actually Parkinson's and Lewy body disease that someone had asked about are, are related and they're on sort of the same spectrum. Um, and in Parkinson's disease also over time, we do in, in many cases see, see cognitive issues. Um, so um, the, the technical rule is that in Parkinson's disease, we see um, movement changes at least a year before we see cognitive changes, whereas in Lewy body disease, the cognitive changes start around the same time as movements, um, but they're really just, it's a spectrum of the same thing. One thing I noticed about the book was, um, it, it, you know, it's tough reading about this stuff. It's, they're very difficult, but I felt like the overall tone was positive and hopeful. Um, it, can you elaborate on that? Like, is, do you feel like we, we are really um, progressing in how we're like fighting these conditions? So in writing it, the goal of the book was to sort of, uh, I wanted to impart a sense of hopefulness because I, I do feel like we are so much closer now, you know, that, that you know, we, we, we are able to do things now that we weren't able to do not that long ago. Even something like, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, for so long, we had no idea who really had the disease. Now, if someone comes in, I can put them in a PET scanner for, you know, a short time and I can tell them, you know, do they have, I can say, you know, do they have elevated amyloid? Do they have elevated tau? I can actually figure out what molecules are building up in their brain, taking a picture um, in a real life person. Um, and that's something we never had before. It's just, it's a incredible, um, incredible step. And in the book, actually, most of the diseases that I wrote about, you know, we've solved, we've cured. Um, so there are, uh, one of the stories is about a, a young woman who um, uh, graduated uh, from college, uh, but she'd been this sort of incredibly brainy, brilliant woman. And then in the summer after college, she uh, wakes up one morning, starts repeating herself. Her mom is sort of suspicious. She uh, gets a fever. Her mom takes her to the hospital and she becomes just totally psychotic. And she starts thinking that she's living in a, in a TV show called The Walking Dead that she had been watching that summer. And um, she ends up actually getting brought to a different hospital where they, uh, they figure out what's the molecule that's causing her disease and they treat her. 
and she goes back to being normal. And that's a, a condition that was only discovered in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, we not only figured out what's causing it, we now figured out how to diagnose it, how to treat it. Um, and these are people who otherwise would have gone their whole lives with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, so there's just been these incredible advances. Um, and um, so the book is meant to be hopeful because I guess that's also how I feel. Great. Um, so we have one on, um on the pandemic, given your con comments on socialization and cognition, what thoughts do you have on the long-term impact given the isolation of the pandemic? So that's a question that we're grappling with. Um, and um, certainly, yeah, I have no doubt that the isolation that everyone has felt in the pandemic is not cognitively healthy. I can see it in our own patients that um, particularly in the beginning of the pandemic when it, you know, really no one was going out at all, um, we were getting more calls about agitation. We were prescribing more medications for agitation. And for caregivers, it's extraordinarily stressful. Many of them were relying on aids to come in and give them relief um, or even the ability to just um, you know, get away with their own social network. Um, to get uh, to get some respite, and suddenly that's taken away. Um, so these safety nets were gone, um, and these many people went to adult day centers, and they were closed. Um, so it was just um, it was sort of catastrophic for a lot of people. It's just been um, really difficult. Yeah, but it, um, and I haven't seen studies showing it yet, but I don't have much doubt in my mind that I don't think that you know I don't think that the isolation of the pandemic has been good for our population. Um, so um, yeah, on the other side, um, there are some things that have come out of it in terms of uh, you know, Zooming and, and virtual conversation um, and actually virtual visits for a lot of our patients um, that we, we never did any in our, our center before. And they've actually been incredibly helpful because for many of our people in our population, it's really hard to get the patients um, all the way to the clinic, especially when they live many hours away. Um, and so um, virtual visits have actually been a huge benefit. Um, so there's been... There's been some some good things, um, but yeah, it, it's been a big problem. So I think we're about out of time. Um, what what I'll ask finally, what is the thing you really want people to take away from your book? The goal was really to inspire. I mean, I don't know if I did this successfully, but the goal is to inspire awe for the brain and also for the scientists who figured out um, how these diseases work and who came up with these cures. They were, so many of them were just ridiculed and, and laughed at. Um, and many of them you know, died before they realized what a, what a contribution they made. Um, so the goal really was for people to get a sense of um, both, you know, how interesting medical history is and, um, and how neat it is that uh, these characters existed. Um, but also just a sense of awe for the, you know, the accomplishments that they had and for, for the, the brain. Okay, if people wanna keep up with you or like your research or anything you're writing, how can they do that? Um, thanks, so I have a, a, a website that's saramanningpeskin.com. Um, and there's a, there should be a button there that um, where you can, can sort of sign up. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this was great, your book is excellent. We really appreciate having you. Thank you so much, this was so fun for me. I really appreciate it, this was, this was awesome. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>